Good morning. It's Monday morning. Technically, it's still morning. <laughs> I, I didn't get at it bright and early. I was very tired from over the weekend, and uh, I uh, I got up late. Probably it was after seven. Uh, ate some breakfast. Read a little bit. Talked to Uncle Freddie down at Junction. Wished I felt like going down there, but it's just too hard to trip on me right now. The old car beat me to death. And then I was tired and I went back to sleep in my chair. And so I'm back up again. I feel like uh, I feel like I dropped a ball there this morning, but you know, I couldn't do no worse than the Kansas City Chiefs did last night in Green Bay. Uh, there are not very many people happy around here about that. <laughs> so anyway, uh, they will have to work out their problems. You can't win the Super Bowl every year, right? But we would like to win it again. Jeremiah, the book of the prophet Jeremiah, we're in chapter 13, and we'll just back up a little bit, and uh, we'll just back up a little bit and pick up where we were Saturday, and uh, we didn't... Uh, I didn't have a program yesterday, but the service at First Baptist Republic was recorded or live streamed, and so I, I shared that on my Facebook page, so you can see Dr. Adrian and me from last night's work if you want to there. Jeremiah chapter 13, this was the sign of the linen girdle and what it represented that the girdle would be useless and good for nothing. And that's how, after it stayed buried in the ground for a while, and that's how God felt about his useless people, that uh, they were good for nothing now. In verse 12, Therefore thou shalt speak unto them this word, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Every bottle shall be filled with wine, and they shall say unto thee, do we not certainly know that every bottle shall be filled with wine? Now now shalt say unto the Lord, No, I'm sorry, guys, my eyes are wonky again. Then shalt thou say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will fill all the inhabitants of this land, even the king that sit upon David's throne, and the priests and the prophets, all the inhabitants of you, Jerusalem with drunkenness and I will dash them one against another even the fathers and the sons together saith the Lord I will not pity nor spare nor have mercy but destroy them hear ye and give ear be not proud for the Lord hath spoken give glory to the Lord your God before he caused darkness before your feet stumbled upon the dark mountains while you look for light and he turn it into the shadow of death and make it gross darkness. Good morning, Beth. My old friend, Beth. Oh, God bless you, Beth. She's a sweet woman. Very kind to me all my life. Um, the reason, of course, as I've explained, that we're doing these programs on the book of Jeremiah is because of course they call him the weeping prophet and he had a lot to weep about God is bringing punitive judgment upon Judah and Jerusalem at this point through Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar and he's condemned them for three reasons uh, because they've gone a-whoring after other gods and because they're sacrificing their children 
and because they believe lies. And the two lies that they believe most, beginning under King Josiah, who was the last good king of Judah, beginning with King Josiah, the lie that they believed was that God would not destroy Jerusalem because that's where the temple was. And so, you know, they cried out, the temple, the temple, the temple is these. And uh, they preached to the people, the prophets, the priests, the princes, the, uh, the higher-ups, the ruling class, the merchants, the court, the king. Well, not the king himself, but it was he watched it happen, even though he was the last good king. They preached to the people that God would never, ever destroy Jerusalem because that's where his name was. He dwelt between the cherubims above the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies. Later on, after the fall and the captivity of Jerusalem, Ezekiel sees in a vision that glory of the Lord departing the temple, leaving the Holy of Holies, leaving his place between the cherubim and, and flying up into heaven in that, in that wheel within a wheel, that spaceship looking thing uh, in the book of Ezekiel. And he, he departed. It departed. The ark, the whole thing departed. It's all gone. It's not lost. We know where it is. Chapter 11 of Revelation shows us that the ark is sitting before, beside the throne of God in heaven right now. The other lie that they believed was that there was going to be peace. Now, this was about 10 years later during wicked King Jehoiakim's reign and continued on into Zedekiah, the last king. Good morning, Kevin. Good to see you alive and well. Um, the lie that they believed was peace, that there was going to be peace and that nothing was going to happen to them and that there was actually peace now. <laughs> I mean, you've heard the, 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 the saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Patrick Henry was quoting Jeremiah. Men may cry, peace, peace, but there is no peace. You know, I remember his, his oration ended. I think it was given to the House of Burgesses in, in the, the State House of Virginia, where he said, uh, I think it was, you know, give me liberty or give me pizza or something like that. I can't remember. And I went to Patrick Henry Junior High School. I ought to remember. Or maybe it was give me liberty or give me death by pizza. They believed lies. And so the parallels are strong between their culture and our now and ours now. And, uh, God hasn't changed, and he judged for those things then. He'll judge for those things now because he's always the same. And so what Jeremiah is, is saying, what God is saying through Jeremiah, and Jeremiah is telling the people to give glory, in chapter 13, verse 16, give glory to the Lord your God because he, before he caused darkness, before your feet stumble upon the dark mountains and while you look for light and he turn it into the shadow of death and make it gross darkness. <sighs> Settle these things beforehand. Make your peace with God now. Don't wait. Don't wait until everything is already off the skids before you come to Christ and repent. Do it ahead of time. As they used to say in sales, buy now and avoid the rush. Before the worst of this happens to you, with so much bad happening to you, like it's happening here in our country. And not just our country. We're not particularly singled out. 
it's all over the West and you can make a case that it's been like this in Europe for a couple of generations. And I guess we thought we were special, but you see, we're not. We don't get a, we don't get a hall pass. I mean, we're, we don't get an exemption. We don't get uh, off the hook. You know, we, we were raised thinking that we were indestructible, that the country was always right. Well, in my generation, we understood very early that the country can't be right and can't be perfect and can't be with liberty and justice for all when a president of the United States can get gunned down by some slob in a t-shirt. You see, we were inoculated against BS. We would never believe it. And so we thought that this aberration was just a one-off and we came up with every kind of way we could come up with to explain it. But then it started happening a lot. Martin Luther King, Robert F. Kennedy, then the reign of Nixon. I mean, you live through Nixon, you can live through anything, right? Or so we thought. But the country was disintegrating in front of our eyes. It began on November 22nd, 1963. And as I've been preaching to you at length, that was the beginning of God's remedial judgments on this country telling us to return to him, to come to him, to believe in him, to straighten up and fly right. We would not, we would not listen. We would not do it. Just like Judah. On September 1st, 2001, the punitive judgment began where God punished us through wars bereavement and death and bad government <laughs> even worse than what we had before because we would not hear we would not repent we would not return in verse 17 in today's lesson continues that Remember, it's verse 16. So give glory to God. Do it now before things go to bed, <laughs> before things go to hell in a handbasket. Well, they're already there. Why? Verse 17. But if you will not hear it, my soul shall weep in secret places for your pride. And we wouldn't hear. And God cried for us. But if you will not hear it, my soul shall weep in secret places for your pride. Mine eye shall weep sore and run down with tears because the Lord's flock is carried away captive. This is Jeremiah expressing his feelings because of what the Lord has said about the inhabitants of Jerusalem. But if you will not hear it, and they wouldn't, my soul shall weep, and it does, in secret places for your pride. Your pride. You know, in Leviticus, God said through Moses, he said that if you won't obey, I will break the pride of your power. He didn't say I'd break your power, so I'll break the pride of your power which in turn actually breaks your power because 
we're the most powerful country on the face of the earth and we have decided to squander that power to not use it when necessary to use it when we shouldn't because of the bad decisions made by the men and women we elect to lead us mine eyes shall weep sore and run down with tears because the Lord's flock is carried away captive God says to Jeremiah in verse 18 say unto the king and to the queen humble yourselves sit down for your principality shall come down even the crown of your glory when Jonah went to Nineveh he said, yet 30 days and Nineveh shall fall. And the king of that country, he rent his garments and he put ashes on his head and he sat down and began to fast and he commanded that everybody repent of their sin and to sit in sackcloth and ashes. From the king all the way down to the animals, nobody was going to eat anything. We're going to fast and we're going to pray because God might stay his hand. God might repent of the evil that he was going to do to us. And God did repent. He sure did. As bad as King Ahab was, married to that witch Jezebel, the priestess of Baal, that old witch. Bad as he was, after he had, after Jezebel killed Naboth, his neighbor, because Ahab wanted his land. Well, he went down there to take after after the queen said that, that Naboth was dead. Well, Jezebel said, hey, oh, Naboth is gone. You go down there and claim that land for yourself. Good morning, Charlene. <laughs> Sung many a day with Charlene. He's one of the best altos I ever worked with. We used to sing all the time together. Anyway, Ahab went down to take possession of Naboth's field, his vineyard. And uh, Elijah the prophet came to meet him. He said, have you killed and then come down to take possession? He says, uh, God's going to kill you. God, God's going to kill you and your blood is going to soak up the ground here in Naboth's field. Well, it's kind of scared old King Ahab, and he went home, and he, he walked softly, and he was quiet, and he fasted, and he didn't put on his king's garments, and he walked around kind of in what we would say, he walked around in his slops for days and wouldn't meet people or receive people or do king stuff at all. The wife didn't know what was wrong with him, and God spoke to Jeremiah. And he said, look at how Ahab's humbled himself before me. He knows he's done wrong. But I'm going to destroy his line. And uh, I'm going to destroy his throne. But I'm not going to do it while he's alive. Because he humbled himself before me. Now, is, <laughs> is, is old Ahab in heaven? I don't think so. But you see... He humbled himself before God, and God reprieved him. Now, he didn't reprieve him very long. Very few years later, he got killed in battle. And so it was decided that the bad things would happen to his line, to his, uh, his posterity, and his throne after he was dead. But God gave him a reprieve because he humbled himself.
And there are many instances of good kings and good men and women of God who have brought their petition to God. And he stayed his hand and repented because they humbled himself. But it's not reserved just to the godly. The ungodly can humble himself also. And God can withdraw his hand. And that's the way it is when he deals with nations. He will show a kindness to someone who doesn't deserve any kindness which he does to all of us who are saved because we don't deserve mercy, we deserve hell. <laughs> what I'm talking about, he is kind even to the ungodly and they don't realize it. And they can have a reprieve too if they humble themselves. And the long story on this is if you humble yourself before God and God gives you the reprieve, then it might encourage you to come to him and to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and to be saved because God wants you to be saved. Verse 18, Say unto the king and to the queen, humble yourselves, sit down, for your principality shall come down, even the crowd of your head the crown of your glory. Remember the glory of a king is his head. That's what Solomon said. His great brain that rules the people in justice and kindness and mercy like he should instead of savaging the people like these kings in Jeremiah's day were doing. Verse 19, the cities of the south shall shut up and none shall open them. Judah shall be carried away captive, all of it. It shall be wholly carried away captive. Why? Because you have sinned against the Lord your God. For almost 13 whole chapters, he's been explaining why they are being judged, why they are being destroyed. Three reasons. Never forget. They went whoring after other gods, spiritual adultery or idolatry. Two, they sacrificed their own children. Charlie Davis, good to see you this morning, sir. Three, they believed lies. We today whore after other gods. Remember, anything that's, that you pay more attention to than Jesus is your God. It's an idol. We whore after other gods. We sacrifice our children. And there are more ways to sacrifice your children, remember, than in an abortuary. We sacrifice our children. We don't raise our own children. As a society, we turn them loose. And we wonder what's wrong now. It's because most of our kids were just turned loose or turned out instead of being raised. Three, we believe lies. We don't believe the truth. Now, Jesus told the Pharisees, you will not believe the truth that you might come to me and be saved. If ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. He said, I'm the prophet. I'm the one Moses said that would come. I'm the Messiah. I am the Christ. I am the Savior. I am the Deliverer. I am Yeshua. But if you don't believe it, you will die in your sins. Same thing now. If you don't believe that Jesus is who he says he is, well, who does he say he is? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Then you will have to die in your sins. And that means that the wages of sin is death. 
and you will have to go to hell, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. You know, fear not him that can kill the body. Yea, rather, fear him who, after he hath killed the body, can cast both body and soul into hell. Yea, fear him. These people were not afraid of God. I'm afraid of him. You need to be too. I tell you what, uh, all the all the smart young men, you know, that have gone to seminary, they a lot smarter than I am. They got education. You see, uh, they've been going to school. I don't know, seven, eight years, nine years, sometimes to get an earned doctorate. After they go to Bible college, and after they go to seminary, and after they get a MDiv or a or 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 a, a demon or something like that, then they might go into further seminary studies and get an earned PhD. And there's many years, many years of study in languages, Greek and Hebrew, and uh, Calvin studies. Uh, that was just a joke. <laughs> I got to tell some of my Baptist friends sometimes that that Calvin is not the fourth person of the Trinity. Uh, if I've insulted any of my Calvinist friends, you're welcome. I intended to insult you, but uh, I will not disfellowship. I will still love to drink coffee and argue about it with you. Now, that's all in fun. But you see, the new breed of preacher, he's not afraid of God. And that's the biggest difference between them and me and the men who came before me. They say that, well, you know, when the Bible says fear God many, many times. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And I said, well, it doesn't really mean to fear him, to be afraid of him, because what it means is to approach him with awe and with reverence and knowing that, that he is mighty and great, but that he loves you. Well, he had all of that is true. The Bible also says, see not that you, <laughs> see, see, see that you not refuse him that speaketh from heaven. And then it said, it is a fearsome thing to fall into the hands of the living God. We will all fall into the hands of the living God, either to life or to condemnation, either to glory or to damnation. Everyone. Now, I'm afraid of God. You know why? Because I've rebelled. I've been a rebellious servant before. And I have, I have sullied his name. I've made him ashamed of the way I've behaved and done things that were ungodly and unseemly and just flat out without any cooth at all. I have blasphemed the name of God. And because of that, because I belong to him, because I belong to him and he's my master and I'm his servant, he has laid the lash upon my back and punished me for those crimes. Here, my home is in heaven. My reward is in heaven. I'll never see hell. But we pay in the flesh for the crimes that we commit in the flesh. We pay here for the wrong that we do. You can't sin for 15, 20, 30 years and drag all that baggage behind you and not, not cause a lot of damage to you and to others. you got to pay for it. See, you're forgiven, but the field of debris is still behind you. It's got to be cleaned up, and that's when you feel the lash on your back. It shows up in weird ways. Uh, 
I've had compliments that set my little head a flurry for music or for exposition, for preaching, for writing. But we all know that because of my wicked past and because of the lashes upon my back, which God has placed there, because he is the good shepherd and he reminded me where my home is and where I need to stay. Just like a good shepherd will whap a sheep in the back of the head if it wanders off and carry it on his shoulders to where he's supposed to be. And if that sheep wanders too far away again, then he might break his leg so that he can't walk far away. We all know that you know, the First Baptist Church of Houston, Texas is not going to call me to be their pastor. And I'm okay with that because it's God who makes these assignments. And ever since I have repented and have accepted my punishment in the woodshed, and have continued to live for Christ. I have never been without a place to preach. I've never been without something to say. I've never been broke. Not since then. I mean, I, I don't have anything that, that, that I don't need. I don't have anything extra. But he has fully taken care of me because that's what a master does to a servant. Master's supposed to take care of the servant. All the servant has to do is obey. And it is, well, don't you want more than life out of that than life, Jimmy, than to just be a servant, be somebody's slave? Is that all you want? Somebody's uh, somebody's uh, man? Is that all you want? Yeah, because my master is Jesus. Jesus said that 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 it is enough for a servant to be as his master. It's enough. My entire purpose in life, my entire goal in life is to be as much like him as I can be. And I get stretched seven ways from Sunday because of that all the time. So, yeah, I'm afraid of him. You need to be afraid of him, too, because he is returning to judge the quick and the dead. That fear is one of the things that helps keep me straight nowadays because I believe the rapture is coming soon and I'm going to meet him in the clouds. You know, he's going to toot. We're going to scoot. Woo! I'll be up there with him. I don't want to go to him from the arms of a strange woman. I don't want to go to him from a beer joint. I don't want to go to him from an opium den. I don't want to go to him from a Roman orgy. I don't want to go to him with filth and nastiness and wickedness in my heart. I want to go up clean. You should want to also. Humble yourselves. I don't care where you are on the scale, whether you got a little bit of sin or you got a whole lot of sin, or whether you're just in perfect communion with Christ at this moment. Remember this about sin as long as we're in the flesh. We're either on our way to shipwreck or we're shipwrecked or we're being rescued from a shipwreck our entire life because the circumstances are always challenging us to deal with that. That is why it's so important that you commit your life to Christ 
and that you do it now, and that you live for him. It all starts in verse 18 here. We've got to humble ourselves. Humble yourself. The day that I realized that in me dwelled no good thing that is in my flesh, when I realized that and understood it, when I realized that the only righteousness I ever had was the righteousness of Christ, the righteousness that he bestows upon me and stills in me because his spirit lives in me, that it all belongs to him and none of it belongs to me. The moment I realized that I wasn't anything but a handful of dirt from the ground, and he was the one who made the dirt. That was the day that great and wonderful things began to happen to me. That was the day that we were able to go into all these different ministries, the nursing home ministries, the homeless ministries, the evangelistic ministries and the teaching and preaching ministries in the churches. The humbling had to come first. I had to realize that the earth didn't quake just because I was walking on it. Give glory to God. Humble yourself.